The Principality of Sealand is probably the most infamous micronation. A former anti-aircraft fort in the North Sea, it's roughly 0.03 square kilometers. It was once a pirate radio station, and today it is ruled by hereditary royalty. It may not look it, but I'm in the presence of royalty. Michael Bates is also known as Prince Michael. Prince Michael of Sealand, that is. There are reasons why Sealand is so well known. It looks like shitty water world, and its rulers are very good at self-promotion. If you go on the internet, you can buy yourself the title of Lord or Duchess, and Red Bull once built a skate ramp there. But Sealand is just one of thousands of micronations around the world. They range from the patently ridiculous, like the Republic of Malassia. It'd be nice to be, I guess, somewhat, somewhat accepted by I guess society as the president of my own country. But as a general definition, micronations also include areas like Freetown Christiania, the semi-autonomous neighborhood of Copenhagen known for its beautiful architecture and its drugs. In the heart of Copenhagen lies a unique community, which has become renowned for one thing. Drugs, which you buy on the main drag, Pusher Street. And that's what I want to focus on, the strange legal limbo of places like Sealand and Christiania, and how it gives libertarians a huge Galtz Gulch sized boner. How deep is the ocean? How high is the sky? Who is John Galt? Sealand in particular offers a valuable watery precedent for marijuana-loving capitalists who don't just want to set up a tiny toy train and dress up in the Nevada desert. So Sealand was an active Royal Navy fort until 1956. In 1965, Wonderful Radio London, the inspiration for the film The Boat That Rocked, occupied this luxurious platform. They can't close us down. They will find a way. Governments loathe people being free. And then, in 1967, the fort was taken by Paddy Roy Bates. He declared independence and made himself the prince of the principality of Sealand. While Sealand is not recognized by any sovereign state, a 1968 firearm charge against Bates was thrown out when it was deemed that the platform he was shooting from was beyond British jurisdiction. This is the dream of seasteading incarnate. Five years ago, the Seasteading Institute envisioned a world with thousands of floating cities. Seasteads, each floating in international waters and testing fresh ideas for governance. The Seasteading Institute grabbed headlines in 2008 when they received half a million dollars in backing from non Elon Musk PayPal guy Peter Thiel. It's obvious that the fantasy of lawless rich people cities at sea is part of a long, proud libertarian tradition. Fiji and Tonga have nearly come to blows over the Minerva Reef, which they both say that they own. You know who else said they owned the Minerva Reef? A Las Vegas real estate tycoon named Michael Oliver, who claimed it for his Republic of Minerva in 1972. It lasted from January until June, when the Tonga government returned to claim the reef. He tried the same thing using his libertarian Phoenix Foundation in the Bahamas in 1973 and again in Vanuatu in 1980. It is clear that libertarians really loved islands in the 70s and 80s. Originally, we were developing an island in the Turks and Caicos called East Caicos Island. Our plan was to develop it into a free port, but they had a local election and we lost our island. Darn! Okay, so what's like an island, but with no troublesome democracy? He wants to build a ship five times larger than any ship ever built. Its name is Freedom Ship. If Nixon can build it, Freedom Ship would be nearly a mile long. Inspired by Jules Verne's propeller island, Stormin Norman Nixon's 90s dream of a 50,000 person libertarian barge was supposed to be sailing the seas of freedom by 2001, but as of last year, it was still in the planning stages and costs had ballooned from six to 10 billion US dollars. 
I wonder why. For many of history's biggest vessels, the Titanic, the Queen Mary, the USS Nimitz, and the supertanker, Yare Viking, would all fit comfortably inside. The Seasteading Institute is just the most modern version of this dream, and maybe the most prominent one thanks to Peter Thiel and a successful Indiegogo campaign, growing interest in libertarian ideas, and funky YouTube videos. The dream of not one, but many floating cities, free from government intrusion to create innovative and disruptive technologies like Yo, or Uber for toilets, or whatever. We're champions of this vision because we believe humanity needs a new blue frontier where we are all free to explore new ways of living together. Which brings us to the Google Barge. A source familiar with a highly secretive project confirms it's been ongoing for more than a year. Spawned in the so-called Google X division of the company, cloaked in secrecy even from most employees. The first barge was spotted in 2011. By 2013, we knew of four. Why did Google need these barges? What black magic were they up to that could not be practiced on American soil? Sources tell us it's Google's multi-million dollar response to Apple's highly successful Apple Store concept. It turns out the barges were most likely just fancy roving Google Glass stores. Three floors of dazzling showrooms and an upper party deck complete with lanais and bars. Except there was to be no party. It seems these barges were all just gigantic fire hazards, and so the Coast Guard shut them down, and so Google scrapped them. But hopefully they can find some glass holes on the Freedom Ship. What do you think? Will the Freedom Ship or any of the Seasteading Institute cities ever be built? Would you want to live in one? Do you think there's value in them or is it all just part of some big right-wing pipe dream? Let us know what you think in the comments and be sure to subscribe for new episodes of This Exists every week. Be excellent to each other. So we normally post videos on Thursdays, which means that our next two videos are scheduled to come out on Christmas Day and New Year's Day. So rather than work through the holidays, which are precious and holy, we're going to do two short one-hitter episodes that'll be going up on those respective days. But because it's the holidays, we're actually going to put them up a day early, so on Christmas Eve and on New Year's Eve, but starting on the This Exists Facebook page. So if you want to get the episodes one day early, we will still post them here. Like This Exists on Facebook and give me that gift for Christmas. Your approval, which I desperately crave. Last week's episode was all about microtonal music, and our comment of the week comes from our still brand new subreddit, r slash woe this exists, and Sumizone, who points out that it's kind of disappointing that the episode didn't touch on string quartets and trombone ensembles and barbershop harmony. There's some great links and you should definitely check out the comment on the subreddit, but it's true. There are normal, not freaky Lego instruments that you can play atypical tones on. In particular, fretless string instruments. A few of you mentioned fretless basses, fretless guitars, uh, and also trombones, which you know is a big old slide on them. Although in the end, they're not sort of traditionally used to play microtonal music, and often those notes when performed on a violin as your adorable eight-year-old is practicing are more of a nuisance than a new sonic treat. Although I think that exploring those different sites of, uh, of notes and, and performances and timbers is a potential valuable future episode. But definitely check out that comment if you're interested in some of the nuances that we were not able to discuss last week. <laughs>